much, and thank you for uh, continuing to sponsor my research, in, regardless of this subject almost, so I really appreciate that. Um, and so this, the larger context of why I'm talking about it, what I will be talking about today is that the overwhelming majority of scholarship, um, not only anthropological, but in general, and diplomacy and conversations in complex studies and beyond about Bosnia analyzed this region mainly through the ethno-national lens. This, was, this became the only frame through which actually the region was accessed. And there are many, um, many scholars who talk about other areas in the world in which gatekeeping concepts become uh, basically um, the, the, the only way through which the regions are becoming known, through which knowledge is being produced. So in India, you have cast, right? In, so in different con concepts, and these concepts, what they do, they oftentimes essentialize and to totalize these societies. Um, so, however, so, and I'm guilty of this, and that's why I have my book there, because I also contributed to this, and I also uh, was part of this process because I got many grants doing exactly this stuff because grants were available for this kind of research. So ethno-nationalism was the theme. If you want to study the Balkans, this is what you do. Um, and for example, socialist studies of the region were bracketed. You could do that in Poland, but not in Bosnia. In Bosnia you do war, in Poland you do post-socialism. Which is really interesting because in Bosnia has so much of post-socialism, and we're going to see that some of that today. So what bugged me the whole time is not that ethno-nationalism is not important. Of course it's important. But the concerns of ordinary people, especially today, uh, reflect many other domains of struggle and points of solidarity and exclusion and inclusion. And this, this talk is going to look at that now. So my current research is a response to that because oftentimes when I go to the field, the other field people complain about care, about the fact that war dispersed the families, that the families are not there together. The traditional Bosnian family cannot take care of their elderly. These 3,000 Bosnians in Srebrenica, many of them worry about people from, from, from Bosnia, refugees from Bosnia and Syracuse, uh, worry about their elderly back home. So there's a lot of this kind of anxiety about transnational aging, and also about who, who is responsible, um, and how to think about the state in uh, this new post-war, post-socialist moment. Um, however, I'm not going to talk about that either, even though I had that prepared, because during the, the last visit to the field, which was this spring, I was just amazed by these uh, tokens, discursive tokens of uh, civility that people constantly use to create boundaries, symbolic and literal boundaries between what they consider to be urbanized and people from the rural areas. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to look today, should have come before, um, I'm going to, to, to examine this discursive self-positioning of urban Bishchani, and Bihać is the sixth largest city in Bosnia, I'm going to tell you where it is on the map, against their seemingly you know, rural, extremely ruralized, allegedly uh, backward, peasant-dominated, and uncivilized post-war predicament. Mm -hmm. These discourses were so palpable, and uh, the tokens of ethnographic tokens of them were so amazing that I couldn't neglect them. So I just kind of collected it, and now I'm going to play with it. So it's a mid-level analysis, but you'll see. So in, in order to enter this course of civility, so we have to just kind of nod, I think I have to nod towards philosophical and political science approach to civility, which is the dominant way we think about it. So one, how is civility perceived? For example, some of the political sciences and philosophers say it's one of the basic virtues of equality, of moral equality, a political ideal that allows civil society to exist and to continue despite differences of people within it. Right? As, a, as almost a prerequisite for civil society to be. Another one, for example, Boyd argues that it's a disposition that makes political life possible, especially in urban areas. Uh, prim it's a, it's fu a primary function is to communicate and display moral attitudes. Mm -hmm. Another one is Calhoun's distinction between polite and political civility, which is also another way to think about uh, in politics and maybe sociocultural dimensions of it. So he defines polite civility as behavior and interactions of everyday life, such as manners, politeness, and courtesies, and then political as membership in political community with its attendant rights and responsibilities. So that he is distinguishing that. And of course, what I'm going to, to look at is how they collapse into each other um, in everyday life, obviously. These, these are abstractions that are helping us to think, because people often say, um, mark somebody as civil, uh, thinking about, for example, polite uh, civility, not necessarily political, and some other people talk about 
civility in a political sense. So it's useful analytically, but I think in everyday life people uh, oftentimes merge these. So what I do is I depart from this. So I explore the lived terrain of civility as a vernacular everyday discourse that shapes encounters in everyday life as well as horizons of inclusion and exclusion and thus hope and politics in contemporary Bosnia and Herzegovina. So more specifically, I'm not interested in establishing and analyzing distinctions between polite and political and moral domains of civility, rather I examine the ways in which these different dimensions and messy connections of civility powerfully spill into each other in everyday life, and how people make sense of them. More specifically, I look at, again, ordinary people's tactical employment of the register of civility to claim authenticity and rights, to pursue innocence, to insert moral dominance and purity, to critique their present-day predicament, and to see recognition and inclusion. Um, this is slightly different from the abstract, because in the abstract I said I was also going to talk about how people use civility to protect their own and others' dignity in everyday trans-ethnic encounters, Well, I already published on that. And I want to actually liberate a little bit civility here from ethnicity. Um, in the previous uh, work I looked at how people use this notion of peoplehood or all obituary with your everyday people to, uh, to distinguish people they encounter in everyday life of any ethnic group from the politics and politicians who are seen as the ones who are in charge of slaughter and ethno-nationalism, but ordinary people, it's not their fault. So they look uh, look at this notion of peoplehood that's outside, of, it's super-ethnic, it's, it's beyond ethnicity that allows them to kind of maneuver very sensitive post-war eth super-ethnicized space. So I already did that, and they do that by you know talking about um, everyday people or obviously you the ordinary people or by equating narod or peoplehood with women and children. It's not narod's fault. It's those, those politicians, ours and foreign. It doesn't matter which side. They're guilty of this. People didn't do anything. But so I already explored that. So I'm not. I'm going to leave that aside. So what interests me here to some extent is how to call somebody uncivil in Bosnia and Herzegovina today marks them primarily as rural. Okay? So there is this urban geography of civility as morally rotten and politically unequipped and very much uncultured. Okay, so we'll see how this works out. In other words, civility is a discursive, thus political shortcut which effectively excludes those who are perceived as unworthy of urban life from the horizons of imagined modern urban Bosnianhood, even among those Bishan, the people of Bihaj, who are themselves, geographically speaking, semi-rural. And that's where it's very important. Some studies of rural urban distinctions in Bosnia uh, usually are located in big cities. I went to the periphery itself, where these are, I think, even more pronounced. So the city, the town I'm going to visit, it has 50,000 people, and it's very kind of cl close to feeling and being rural. So I think anxieties are even more heightened where the boundaries are more blurry. Um, so here is an example from the field. So I'm going to give you an example of this discourse, okay? This is me with one of my informants, Adam. He says, so I say, this is my vignette. It is a gray, crisp February day in the northwestern Boston town of Bihać. Adam, a 60-year-old man from Bihać, and one of my main informants, is giving me a ride from my apartment to my new field site, a home, a home for elderly and needy people, located on the outskirts of Bihać. Adam's body gets tense as he maneuvers one of Bihać's numerous narrow two-way streets. Eventually, the car hits a large hole, jerks, and our bodies shake from the impact. Adam curses loudly, stops the car, and moves out. He kneels in front of the car, examining potential damages. The car behind us honks the horn. Adam dismisses it with an irritated hand wave. He comes back to the car, starts driving again, steering between the car's people and street holes while commenting, do you see this? I mean, look at this street. And all of them are like this, meaning damaged and full of holes. We went back at least 50 years in time. Do you know how well made the street was in the 80s? We are now in Kamenom Dob, the Stone Age, u pre-civilizacijskom periodu, in the pre-civilization period. When I do not respond to his angry comment, Adam continues. Andrew, do you see these people? They're walking in the middle of the street. Look at this guy, points at the middle-aged man in a long jacket and a hat. He does not use the sidewalk. He's walking Sredinom Jade in the middle of the street. He's not even looking at who or what is behind him, as if he owns this town. And Bihat is full of them. He's not from this town. You can tell by how he walks. Dolce was the asphalt that he caught the asphalt. I'll never hold it on him, but doesn't know how to walk on it. You know how it is. Rat is bad 
too old, he said, for about 50 going to this one's like it. The war costs come to rise to the top, and now it needs another 50 years to descend back mm -hmm. to the bottom. Mm -hmm. What's that? What about that? Let's please get to the end of this road. You see, he was fuming. Adam was really, really upset. So, Adam's words are exemplary of this discursive self positioning of urban beast and self perceived urban beast Chinese citizens and village against their allegedly, again, backwards rural, peasant dominated, un and uncivilized post for predicament. These registers of civility sometimes work in concert and other times against the dominant ethno-national scripts. And this is, I think, what's interesting here, thus allowing for more complicated representations of lives and deaths in the Balkans. So they're reflective and productive of post-war and post-socialist imaginings, and they people bring socialism back in here, you'll see that in a second, and workings and limitations of citizenship, post political economy, and the state. There are many grievances that he's articulating by being so so, in order to make sense of this, I had to use several different theories and, and ways of thinking about this. One, one of them is the theories of Balkanism. Uh, the other one is the Bourdieu's concept of distinction and Mary Douglas's notion of purity and danger. So these are all very complicated and long, so I'll just give you a very superficial uh, one of Balkanism and then I'll, I'll nod towards Bourdieu and, and, and Douglas as we go through ethnographic. So to understand volcanism, we have to locate this study. Oh, this should have come first. Not, not only, I don't want to look at this through lens of transatlantic, but through rural urban topography, but as I said, they're complicated, complicatedly intertwined. So location, Bosnia is in the Balkans, right? And Bosnia is the heart-shaped land in the middle of Europe. It's not heart-shaped or the middle of Europe. That's what my informants say, so nod when they say that to that. To you. Uh, and this is the, our town sixth largest town, it's my hometown. My book was located, my first book was located here, so I went far away from the first time, six hours by car. Um, and Bihać is a very interesting and very much understudied uh, town in Bosnia. It was one of the uh, six UN protected safe zones. Um, and uh, while we hear a lot about Sarajevo and Srebrenica and many others, Bihać kind of is, as one commentator called, Bosnian forgotten battlefield. It's also very interesting because it had internal Muslim Muslim war. I don't have time, I'm happy to talk about that. But a lot of stuff has to be done in Bihaj, and I'm only beginning the study of Bihaj uh, now. So just to tell you a little bit about how Bosnian war is often depicted. So the Bosnian war, part, part, uh, part of these larger Yugoslav wars, uh, took place between 92 and 95. Between what now we like to think about as three ethnic groups, Bosnian Serbs, Croats, and Bosnians, or Bosnian Muslims, um, and uh, this is a problematic reading of it, but let's leave it there. It claimed one. Uh, uh, There's so many tangential uh, so stories. I, you know, I wrote a whole book trying to kind of, the, uh, uh, kind of try to challenge some of these um, ways of, of framing the war, um, because. Ethnic, uh, ethnicity, ethno-nationalism as such in Bosnia is a product, not the cause of the war. So um, this is why I'm hesitant to say that the war uh, happened because these three people are just, it, violence erupted between them, of course, it's not a thing. So it claimed 100,000 lives and two out of four million people were uprooted. And this is crucial for this study because they were not equally uprooted and not in the same way. Right? Majority of people who were ethnically cleansed were actually people from rural areas. Uh, while the bigger cities were under siege. So many of the rural people were basically forced into cities or abroad, many of them internally displaced. So this caused all sorts of internal migrations that oftentimes when you talk about the war, that's totally overlooked because it's seen always through did uh, Serbs push Muslim, uh, Muslims out or what. But this kind of rural urban dynamic <coughs> is left out. So Dayton Peace Agreement is signed in Paris on December 14, 1995. It had many celebrations of 20 years of Dayton that I was part of last two months ago. Very interesting stuff was happening about talking about the legacies of Dayton. Um, and then this was, uh, Bosnia became a site of very strong, extremely powerful, visible, expensive international intervention, which inserted consociational model of democracy, which institutionalized ethnicity, within the state and on the sub-state level, creating what I believe is an empty state in the country and giving lots of power to the sub-state levels of governance. And this is what Bosnia, which was very much intermixed before the war, looks out as a product of war and post-war uh, state making. So this is Bosnia after the war, divided between Republika Srpska, very centralized, and the Federation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, 
between um, the Republic of Serbia, majority Serb, and Federation Croat and Muslim, 51% uh, of territory divided into 10 different cantons. So this kind of division, vision and division of Bosnia as a place where ethnically conceived people live in ethnically conceived territories became the way we read the country. We think about peace, we think about resolution through this kind of establishment of very rigid ideas of who belongs who, which David Campbell beautifully called, um, how does he call it? Enclave multi-ethnicity, mm -hmm. everyone <laughs> in their own corner, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so this is ethnicization of the war story, right, and the war, the, the, what war was about, which masks, for example, rural-urban dynamics and all sorts of nesting balkanisms. So what is balkanism? Balkanism is, for those of you who know Orientalism by Edward Said, is basically a theory that says that, uh, that looks at how Western, Western, you know, complicated Western entity, uh, imagines and deals with the Balkan, which is seen as primitive, uh, backward other. Out, uh, that that is different from the Orient. But so knowledge, academia, um, diplomacy, all contribute to Orientalisms, right? You have institutes of Oriental studies that create knowledge of the Orient. However, where Balkanism is different, and this is Maria Todorova speaking, the main expert on this, is saying that Balkan uh, it is tangible, it does exist, unlike Orient is kind of vague where exactly the boundaries are. We have the Balkan mountain, we have the peninsula, right? We know kind of where the boundaries are, but it's also within Europe. It's not the external other. So it's the other within, which is a very interesting thing. Then other scholars build on that and looked at nesting Balkanisms. Don't read all this, I'll tell you. Basically, the idea that within the Balkans, especially in the former Yugoslavia, you always have the one that's the, the, the republic, and now the country that's, that's more Western and, um, and Northern, looking at the one south and east of it as Balkan. So Slovenia is not Balkan, Croatia. Balkan starts in Croatia. Croatia says, no, Balkan starts in Bosnia. Bosnia says, no, it's kind of Serbia. The only <laughs> ones who are proudly Balkan are actually Bulgarians. They even have Balkan airlines, right? <laughs> um, but everyone else tries to be, not to be Balkan because being Balkan is primitive and also very masculine, unlike Oriental before 2011, uh, 2001, before 9-11. Uh, the Oriental other was the exotic belly dancer, right? But mm -hmm. here you have very strong rapist, kind of rapist, mm -hmm. uh, you know, alcohol-driven uh, man in the Balkans. So I teach this for three weeks, so now I'm kind of just giving you a very short uh, crash course in Balkanism. And then the Apotistas does a beautiful job explaining how then within different republics there are different uh, 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 Balkan others within. So she says in Macedonia, uh, Albanian, uh, Macedonians see Albanians as, as actually the Balkan other, and Albanians also see Macedonians. So there, there, is, there is an interplay even within the republics. Well, what this um, still, and some people say, okay, it, it, we have to pay attention to all that. Also, we have to pay attention to how this sometimes plays itself in the space of topography and geography. So Zhivkovic talks about highland Serbs and lowland Croats, where highland is mountain, you know, ready to nationalist and lowland Croats are more peaceful. And then Hans and Janssen talk about, but let's look at gender representations of this as well. So very kind of interesting set of works that are um, emerging, have been emerging for the last 15 years about Balkanism. So um, the location uh, about, uh, uh, the location in, uh, of, um, of Bosnia and Yugoslavia in general is one of periphery and rurality. Uh, because Yugoslavia, especially Bosnia, was rural, totally rural, until massive urbanization that socialist led, led Tito government in, introduced. Bosnia didn't have paved roads before Tito came, in other words. So we cannot think about discourse that Adam talks about streets without understanding actually what came before the war. So there was, during the Yugoslav times, this was a huge migration of people from rural areas to industrialized centers in Bosnia and, and the rest of Yugoslavia. And this was propagated through Tito's idea of huge work actions, where, which were voluntarily, la voluntary labor activities of young people to build infrastructure of the country. So Yugoslavia, for many people, even though it's such an artificial country, for many people was not this abstract entity, imagined community, some abstraction. They literally build it. Mm -hmm. Build it's. I mean, these are these are youth brigades. My my father has four medals for this. I mean, it's an mm -hmm. amazing study. Um, but people who built Yugoslavia were 
barely removed from village mud, in other words. Uh, I mean, we're talking about the 60s, right, when Yugoslavia is being built through these youth literally building bridges and building factories and building, um, making it more modern. So, um, so I'm going to skip this. I'm just saying that ta in town of Bihać, this might be even a beautiful uh, place to study because exactly it's at this boundary between urban and rural and only recently it has become modernized. Here is Bihać. This is what it looks like today. Not a bad uh, space for study. It's a beautiful mm -hmm. river urna that my daughter is named after. Um, you see now why you have to. Um, and it's a, it's a, you know, it has this kind of modern feel, but uh, feel, but you, you just walk in a couple blocks out and people have kitchens, uh, chickens and, and cows, and so it, it feels rural in some other places. So to think about now all this stuff I said, and to think about how people use civility, discourses of civility, I divide them up into three different areas. A discourse is a materiality, and this is very important thinking about what I just said, how Yugoslavia was built. The material things that become, the treatment of which becomes the way you, you display your civility. How do you treat streets and lights, right, or infrastructure? The other one is how you walk and talk, socio-cultural distinction, and then discourse of perpetual danger, how this rurality is seeping in and endangering lives of urban so the first one is crumbling infrastructure. So how people treat the material tokens of urban life and not only in treat treatment of other people. So once civility is displayed through being respectful and tolerant towards buildings and, and uh, material tokens. Again, this is important because Yugoslavia was built right through this infrastructure, very kind of hands-on built community, not just imagined one. War in this discourse is an earthquake. Right? War destroys all these buildings, right? it shakes them up. But it also what it does, it, it kind of pushes, like the mud, right? pushes the, the, the rural into the urban. And um, this rural ethnic other oftentimes is talked about as the one who started the war, but it's also the rural other within that contributes to this destruction of urban, urban space. Um, sealing the countryside triumph over the city, and people constantly take, say they they want the peasants want. Mm -hmm. So they call this herbicide. Okay, so that that urban uh, war actually produced this destruction, but that post-war situation sealed it through herbicide. Mm -hmm. They say this is a targeted destruction of modernity and urbanity because factories, libraries, museums, and also the streets are not, not being repaired by people in power who are peasants. So it's not only who is destroying it, but what do they do in post-war period? Post-war period, politics is run by rural other, right? They're in charge, they came to the cities during the war, they created their kin, I mean, I'm, this is me from the position of the urban Muslim speaking, right? This is, this is how they talk, not what I claim. That actually they didn't want to invest any of the money to foreign donations in repairing of these modern tokens of life because they don't care. They care about compost to their village, right? <laughs> so that's what they say. This is where they put the money that they didn't corruptly take. And they talk about this through the lens of family and kinship. I mean, it's so rich ethnographically because they say they all stick together and they just give to each other to their own kin. They don't care about civil life the individual citizenship and what we need to protect, you know, public sphere. Now it's all about you know, hidden deals, families, and you'll see this comes uh, through in the, in the data I'll share. So they talk about presentization of their city, and they say, this is the result of big. And I said, what's big? Big is Brekovica, Izrčić, Gata. These are three villages around Bihać. They say that families, tycoons, um, and business shady business dealers who became rich over during the war through, through the black market run their city now. They're sitting in the parliament, they're sitting everywhere. And actually the big is engaged in the systematic neglect of the city. So it's not about the Serbs in Banja or Serbs in Serbia, it's about big actually systematically destroying who we really are, right? So how they do that? Through ideas of wood, streets, gym, swimming pools, apartment buildings. So here are some examples. These are the streets, they say. They don't want to repair them, right? They let it because they don't care. They never had pavement. This is the rhetoric, right? They don't care about that stuff. One of the main tokens of this became the central heating system. This is what Tito built. 
modernized central heating system existed before the war in Bihar. However, it was destroyed after the war. Uh, very recently, since 2014, it was leveled. It was never repaired because this is what urban people say. Those newcomers, Dojle or rural people, don't want to pay for the central heating system because they don't know what it is. So they create this kind of distinction, knowledge of speaking via materiality and destruction. Another one is the boat. So since central heating system is destroyed, now people had to cut the wood and wood became a huge business. That's my next, next project, forestry and forests in Bosnia, the most forested country in Europe. So what's happening now is the bulk, uh, balconies of people are filled. You see, you can't see much, this is all wood stored in them, so the, the buildings are sinking into the soil, and this was never imagined. They say instead of drinking cappuccino, as we did before the war on our balconies, our aesthetic is now wood. And one of my, when I, this is my apartment building where my parents live, and when I said to one of my friends and neighbors, what's happening when I came back and saw this, she said, welcome to the jungle. So this is another instance of them not wanting to repair the central heating system, so we cannot enjoy our coffee in the afternoon. Another one is the gym. Here is Welcome to the Bronx. It actually, and I have a picture, but I couldn't find it, that says on this former gym that was a pride in Bihar before the war. And now I took my daughter there for climbing. Um, so it's, it's in use. This is the gym and this is the swimming pool. And um, they, they were, uh, for many people, very important ideas of socialist youth, right? This is where they go and exercise and come together and, and but however, now they're in crumbles. So here is Osman being very upset after he took me to the gym at night and there were no street lights. He said, why do they need street lights? They need the stars only to lead them, right? They're close to nature, <laughs> right? So here is how he, he's angry as well. See, this is what he says. Do you know why I'm angry? Because the gym looks like a horse table. Do you see how dirty it is? Look, and I remember so clearly when it was first constructed in the late 50s. I had my high school gym classes in here. The floors were shiny, the walls were white. It was such a modern gym. And now it is crumbling, filthy. Come with me outside, and he told me outside. See this building? Points to the destroyed building nearby. This was a swimming pool, a great one built by Tito. Even Mordnar, sailor from Split, a very major uh, volleyball pool team, came and played here. It was bombed during the war and never repaired. Why, you ask? Because those in power, those primitives, don't think that money should be invested in the repair of a public pool. They would rather divert those funds for jubar, compost, delivered to the people in the village they originated from, than to the city's public pool. Because they prefer jubar over swimming. Village people are scared of water. Most of them never learn how to swim. <laughs> I mean, really, uh, it's even hard to begin with this. But his angry statements is exceptionally rich, and it provides insight into the ways in which the discourses around the post-war uh, destruction of infrastructure became, mo became mobilized to provide a social critique of the current predicament, as well as new parameters of citizen exclusion. Jim's former shiny floors and white walls stand for past civilized times when modernity and urbanity prevailed, and its citizens, Tito's youth, had a necessary infrastructure to live a proper city life, to be civil, right? They arrived, then arrived the relapse. The modern lifestyle was interrupted and destroyed during the war, which, according to this account, was initiated by the rural folk. This trend of destruction of civilization continues into the present day. The dominant post-war rural elite, the big, are apparently scared of flight and swimming, despising everything city, modern and urban. This alleged reality, uh, reality's hatred of everything urban is to Osman at least most visible in the current government's neglect of modern objects, light gyms, and swimming pools. This neglect and the related destruction of urban infrastructure left urban Christian disoriented. They talk about them being exiled in their own town. Um, where their norms and values have no value in place. The self-distancing of urban folk from the war and post-war destruction also allows for their claim to moral superiority. Since they did not start the conflict, they had to be its victims, the ultimate innocence of the Balkan Wars. Mm -hmm. So here is this, no, it's, uh, it's the rural people, it's those rural nationalist villages, right? So this, that's one. The other one is the ways of talking and eating and being in the world. I'm, I'm building on, obviously, Bourdieu's notion of distinction. I have a long definition, but I'll just give you the short one. These distinctions are contested practices of social stratification surrounding the embodiment of culture, where those with higher volume of cultural capital in Bourdieu's sense, the French bourgeoisie, determine what counts as a taste within the society, you know, how you should walk, how you should sit, and this is obviously produced through class, 
uh, but the, um, it's masked as taste, right? And so it's very much uh, class dominant, but I'm not going to go, I have more, I don't want to bore you with that. Um, so so uh, here are examples to eating, dressing, and, um, and, and thinking and doing culture. So there are three domains of this. One is the appreciation of culture that these rural people have, because the seven main institutions of culture in Bosnia have been closed. Mm -hmm. And I actually cannot remember them all, but the National Museum of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the History Museum of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Museum for Literary and Theater uh, Arts, the National Gallery of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the National Film Archive, the National University Library, the National Library of Blind Persons, all of them are defunded. And this is because one of my informants said, he is a professor at the university, he said, because they don't know how to run a museum. It's just they don't have that disposition, right? So this is their, because they're in power and they don't invest in that, there's no money for culture, because who needs culture, right? So that's, that's how they see this, uh, this process. The other one is the, uh, the way how they walk. And this we so, um, and how these people who are themselves semi-rural, right, how they try to eliminate this rural other within. And I'm really interested in this rural other within, not this rural other that's kind of, you know, ethnic other far away, but this rural other within. And so uh, uh, from the beginning, I don't read all of this, but Adam says to us, he, and he's talking about a guy that he and I saw from our car, he's not from this town, you can tell by how he walks. He's finally, he caught the asphalt, right? He doesn't know how to walk on it. So he also compared these rural others to animals, saying that they walk in the middle of the street cold, just like sheep, which is explained by their embodied ne cultura, lack of culture, right? and the rural proximity to animals in nature. Okay. So this is another way to, you know, to, 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 to address this. So this collective walking on the street, or collective sitting on the grass, that was another way to say, well, these internally displaced people, they call them refugees. You know, the women, they don't have anything to do, so they just take their blankets and they sit on the grass, and the whole day they sit and just, we pass by, and they ask, where were you? What were you buying? They don't give us any distance, right? They're just sitting on the grass. There are benches there. Why don't they sit on the bench, right? So this mm -hmm. collective sitting on the grass or walking on the street is thus seen as a proof of a village group mentality that does not align well with the individual citizen mentality and urban setting of political civility where the streets are sidewalk equipped. So one of my neighbors said, I never even walk there anymore because those women are s s um, sitting there. They'll ask me what I bought, where I bought it, how much the meat it cost today. So I, and they don't even know me, they, they address me. So she said, I go a different way. People are actually creating different routes uh, to get places to avoid the places that are extremely corrupt by rurality, which is really one of my favorite examples is the, the Great Wall of China and Tepsia. Okay. So this is the Great Wall of China. The Great Wall of China, Kines Kizil, is the longest building built during the Titus time in, in Bihać. It's pretty huge, actually. And it was built because Bihać, next to Bihać, was the second largest in Europe military base. Uh, and uh, the largest one in Yugoslavia, called Jaleva. And many of the people who were employed by the base came from all over the country. It was, a, and they were play, They were given apartments, very nice apartments in this building. So this building became a symbol of Yugoslav modernity, military, socialist, multiculturality, brotherhood and unity, and many mixed marriages. Many kids who actually lived there came from mixed marriages. So people were from all over the place. These were some of the first people to leave when the war began because Jaleva was uh, destroyed uh, by the Yugoslav people army as they were pulling out of Bihać. And many, I would say 70% of the families were uh, Serb uh, uh, in there, or mixed marriage with at least one parent was Serb, so they actually left the town or felt that they were forced to leave. This left many empty apartments who moved in, inter internally displaced, but more economically savvy, privileged, big elites, right? So what happened is that now these elites walk around with Tepsia. Tepsia is this dish that's traditional Bosnian dish uh, to make Bosnian pies, and that you eat with your fingers. Here I am, here I am guilty of eating mm -hmm. it. So what you do is you, they, and one of my informants said, I don't have anything against steps here, but it doesn't belong to the Great Wall of China, right? Okay. So what this means is, this is Douglas, this is Mary Douglas saying, Pepsi is matter out of place. It, it, uh, it's inappropriate to mix these two categorically distinct substances, the Great Wall of China and Tepsia. So 
there has to be constant symbolic and literal boundary making. So tepsis have to go where they belong, right? So that's another example. The final one is the bike thieves and uh, fake lions. So um, this is the danger that this rural presence creates for urban, civil Bosnians. So they, many of my informants constantly talked about fear, and this fear began with uh, the arrival of refugees from, from the villages, and they were pushed out of their villages and came, and, and immediately people felt very sympathetic and you know, tried to help them, but with time, suddenly these refugees, especially from one village called Arashat, became the bike thieves. There was this a rumor that they are stealing bikes, and bike was the highest war commodity because there's no gas. So it, they became the bike stealers, okay? So that's one thing. And the other one is that they build houses, now they have lots of money through corruption and control of government and through not repairing the streets, and so this is all the discourse, right? So they actually create these houses in a way that it's not appropriate for the local soil. And this example is from actually Mostar because the teacher did a beautiful job explaining the danger that these new houses create for urban environment. So she says to her students, student, due to this type of soil in which the homes in the Sturmina neighborhood, and it's a very kind of a tilted part of Mostar, it's, it's pretty steep, um, where many new elites construct their homes, in Mostar are built, if there is an earthquake, which Mostar does have, or a big flood, all those houses with their big fake lions, which is the main symbol of Kirch and this new, <laughs> the new rich and bad taste, are going to start sliding and they will push now the normal people, urban people, right, into the river. So the teacher emphasized that the new elites who quickly and illicitly gain fortunes overnight are lacking cultural capital and she labeled them as uneducated and uncultured. So their lack of culture was visible in the absence of knowledge about the poor quality of monster soil. They don't have roots in that soil, right? So these elites who do not have deep roots in Gradska Sredina or urban environment, they, that, is, that generates cosmopolitan awareness and disposition became the source of the overall cultural decline, dangerous for the social, moral, and even physical safety of urban people in Mostar. So here is one of these houses. I, I just picked the one with few, a bit, a bit little lines. There's some huge ones, but um, this one was clearer than the rest of them. So a lot, this is the sign of Kitch. This is a typical new home. This one is not on the, on the steep side of town, luckily. So urbanity strikes back, right? They cannot tolerate this anymore. So here is some, this is one of the last slides. So here is Alma, who is self-proclaimed urban beach junker, who on the Facebook, I'm now reading her, um, puts this, and she has millions of friends, and she puts this statement. When I see who calls themselves Bihaj people today, I'm tempted to remove the place of birth from my birth certificate. Like Bosnia without peace, like a shitty person without documents, I feel like an invader. I'm not from here. So, she says, she actually uses in Bosnian language to, to make a point. She uses, this is kind of very uh, linguistic, linguistically a tricky thing. She uses the word, not adate, which is proper, but adavle, which is the way that rural people sometimes are imagined to speak, right? So by underlying this mistake, she establishes herself as superior, educated, culture and urban against those uncivil others who, regardless of their illiteracy, are economic and politically more powerful. This is where a lot of their grievances come from. Many reactions follow this, many of which, uh, one of which said, you should catapult out all those who came from any reason to be had. Nowhere else does this exist, that people leave their birthplaces, towns and cities like this. This is an invasion of Bihać and Bishchan. So this propelled, this kind of feeling of decades of being, um, you know, seen as being dominated by the reality is creating a pulse for violence against and distribution. Um, and um, so urban Bishchan are thus invaded by the hordes of badly spoken, uncivilized and poorly behaved, uncultured peasants, the rural others within. This sense of precariousness requires drastic means, right? The fear, um, including the violent removal of those who do not belong by firing them out of the hatch of cannons. Mm -hmm. So conclusions. Uh, let me, this should come later, but. Um, so in these precarious times of political uncertainty, radical poli politics and polarization, civility has emerged as an important concept in political and moral theory. Numerous scholars are attempting to clarify the boundaries of the concept as well as to grasp different dimensions of it, political and polite, moral and civic. 
In this piece, however, I focus on civility as a discourse of urbanity, a powerful repertoire of exclusion of uncivil and non-urban others, and related exclusion of the uncivil rural other than men. These exclamations of civility are also frequently lamented, lament for times and places imagined a real past which allegedly existed before the wars in the 90s when the socialist ideas of modernity, urbanity, progress and development were, um, I'm missing a word, were there. <laughs> These complicated public lament about the future past serve as a powerful site of public as political critique of the present and they offer local philosophies and geographies of how, where and with whom uh, we, the urban Bosnians, ought to live. These ethnographically gathered tokens of distinction, such as woods, swimming pools, gyms, bicycles, and Pepsi, complicate our understanding of how the fragmented post agent and post war Bosnian society is rearranging and rearticulating itself, and they reveal some largely ignored yet potent fault lines, commonalities, and visions of politics, economics, and culture in contemporary big country and beyond. I went too fast because I was scared I had too many slides. Now I, I, I regret speaking so quickly. Um, so that's all I prepared for today. <laughs> and 